started here. So um, typically in these introductions, people always start off saying it's a pleasure to introduce so-and-so. Um, and uh, yeah, when it's uh, a longtime friend, former advisor, and uh, mentor, uh, I can stand up here today and, and say with conviction that it really is a pleasure to uh, introduce Tyrone today. Um, so Tyrone uh, started off his, his life in Columbia, South Carolina, and went off to uh, Harvard uh, for his undergrad, and then to Berkeley for a PhD, uh, as well as a postdoc, and then uh, that's where he's a faculty member now. Now, that's impressive in and of itself, but I'd like to give a little timeline to give us a little context. So, he graduated in 1985, I graduated in 1987. Um, he started at Berkeley two years before uh, I did. Um, and he and I were graduate school uh, colleagues. Uh, we were graduate students together, uh, largely because he was on the graduate admissions committee. And I, I think he uh, made sure that my application wasn't overlooked, even though we'd, we'd never met each other at that time. Um, he ended up uh, finishing his PhD in, in four years, because he uh, applied for an NSF postdoctoral fellowship thinking that there's no way he would get it in his third year um, and that he would use that feedback to, to write a stronger proposal next year. Well, he actually did get it funded, so he wrapped up his PhD in four years, uh, was six months into his postdoc when his advisor at Berkeley uh, left for Dean's position. And so he was essentially hired back uh, four and a half years after starting his PhD at Berkeley to essentially replace his major professor. Um, meanwhile, I'm still in graduate school. And, uh, I, I, I ended up, uh, my advisor left in my fourth year, uh, and I ended up finishing in, in Tyrone's lab. Um, so before I, uh, yeah, exactly. So before, before I was even, you know, I think a, a year or so into my first postdoc, Tyrone was already tenured, three years <laughs> after starting at Berkeley. Um, I think he became a full professor just about the same time I got my first job. <laughs> so he's been a full professor for like, what, like almost 10 years now? Yeah, but I'm sure I make a lot less than you do, I'm sure. So <laughs> that's where it all evens out. <laughs> So anyway, um, it's a tremendous pleasure. Uh, he, you know, he started off. Uh, he's he's been an endocrine um, developmental biologist studying amphibians for ages and ages. He, uh, you know, was uh, started some work many years ago that you'll you'll hear the story of today, where he received some funds by this uh, manufacturer called Novartis that makes a compound called atrazine. And uh, it uh, totally transformed uh, both his, his, his research project as well as his political and social uh, view of the world. So uh, with that, I give you a Thanks, Paul. I can't even give you a hug, but I did that last night. Yeah. <laughs> After the talk, I mean, not while you were asleep. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks a lot, Paul. We got a good story. I'd like to meet this guy sometime. And I also want to thank all of you for coming out and, and for the invitation and all that kind of stuff. And as usual, if you've ever seen me speak, before I talk about science, I always do my acknowledgments first. That way, if I run out of time, the important stuff got done. My first acknowledgment is always to my wife, Catherine Kim, and my son and my daughter for their love and support. And probably second in line, I want to thank my funding sources. And and also, as a matter of disclosure, I've been funded by those companies, as you just heard, Novartis and Syngenta, although they've since, as you'll see why, decided they don't want to really hang out with me anymore. <laughs> um, but to be fair to the other side, throughout my talk, I will give you perspectives from the industry. So, so they have slightly different perspectives, things that I call words from our former sponsor. And then I want to thank all of the students that have been involved in the work. I'm going to talk to you really for about 10 years worth of stuff. And, and would also like to point out here that everybody's in blue is an undergraduate. So I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate starting with an REU, NSF, when I was a freshman. And, and really, I really started graduate school in 1986 when I started that program because I had a professor who treated me that way. And so trying to give back to that, I work, as I said, with a lot of undergraduates. Here's my new crew. And as you can also see from the photograph, we enjoy quite a bit of diversity in my lab. 
And that not only makes for some crazy potlucks, which I lost one of my best cooks there, um, but also makes for some really great science. And finally, just a shout out to my parents, my family in general. You can also see we enjoy a lot of diversity there as well. And finally, a dedication to my grandmother who passed away in 2005. It was her love of teaching that got passed on to me and that also has really been with me throughout my entire career. So dedicate it to my grandmother. And as I say, speaking of my grandmother, this is not my grandmother, but this is a quote that for the longest time I thought was mine actually, but turns out it's attributed to somebody much smarter. <laughs> you don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. And, and that's not an insult, but that's sort of really because I've been involved in, in, in a lot of public speaking, not to academic audiences, this is sort of really a, a philosophy that I think I've ad adapted. I've tried to eliminate jargon. I try to, rather than give a speech or give a lecture, I try to tell a story, as, as another great orator said, in, in a language that everybody can, can understand. And that's what I'm going to try to do today, is really just tell you a story honestly how I got from point A to B. Now, I don't have time to start, I don't have time to start with my African roots, <laughs> the beginning of that story, nor do I have time to start with my five-year-old, or at least from when I was five years old, love of amphibian biology. Um, but I'm going to pick it up here, and actually some work that Paul Barber and I became involved in um, back when he was working with me in my, in my lab. We started working in East Africa, actually trying to understand what I call evolutionary developmental endocrinology of African reed frogs. Um, in particular, this is Hyperilius argus, where the males and the females are differently colored. So much so that if you didn't know any better, you'd think they were two different species if you saw them in the wild. And my interest in general are in trying to understand how hormones regulate development, metamorphosis and growth and sex differentiation, but also in trying to understand how the environment regulates those hormones that regulate development and trying to understand the evolution of those processes. And this is where Paul and I really interacted um, in a very unique and a very neat, a very neat way. What I was particularly interested in, in this species and in this complex at the time was, one, how these animals end up differently colored, and again, how it evolved and why. What is the ecologically and evolutionary significance of this extreme sexual dimorphism? I published a paper with an undergraduate, Karen Menendez, where we showed that in fact for the first time we raised these animals in the laboratory and we showed that they all start out green, whether or not you're male or female. Then we showed that the male hormone testosterone has no impact on these frogs, but the female hormone estrogen, in this case estradiol, will induce a color change regardless of whether or not you're male or female. And this is significant because essentially what happens is the females at puberty, at sexual maturity, start to make estrogen, and that estrogen then binds to a receptor in the skin and induces the color change. <coughs> so really what Paul and I are still trying to do, if NSF would ever listen, is trying to understand not just the hormonal regulation of this developmental process, but how and why it evolved, why it is the way that it is. Turns out, though, that as you just heard, that there was an interesting detour about 12 or 13 years ago when my wife was in the audience, that beautiful woman you saw in the beginning, and heard me giving this talk, and she said, well, gee, Tyrone, why don't you patent that frog? And I, and, and I said, gee, why would I ever patent a frog? You can't patent a frog. And her brother said, you can't patent a frog. Heretofore to be referred to as the assay to this, he was a lawyer, so he had all the, all the words for that. And we did. I thought it sounded kind of neat, so we called it the Hyperilis Argus Endocrine Screen, or the Hayes Test. <laughs> <laughs> and here's why you would patent a frog. Here's why you would patent a frog. In this case, a process or the use of this frog. So here's a control. They all start out green. And we can raise these by the tens of thousands. They're about the size of your pinky nail when they metamorphose. We can dip them in estradiol, a natural estrogen that circulates in every woman in this room. And we can induce a color change. We can dip them in ethanyl estradiol, the synthetic estrogen that's used in birth control pill. And we can induce, you see the spots developing a color change in a matter of days. We can dip them in diester stilbestrol, a non-steroidal synthetic pharmaceutical estrogen that was used a few years ago in, in women to treat various conditions. Or we can dip them in compounds like DDT, which isn't a hormone or an estrogen, but we know it binds to the estrogen receptor, this pesticide, and can turn it on. So here was the thing. We tested dozens of compounds, or examined dozens of compounds, and what we found was that every one of these chemicals that acted like an estrogen and caused color change in this frog 
was also known to bind to receptor in humans and promote breast cancer. So we had this model where we could raise these animals by tens of thousands and test individual chemicals with a very simple, cheap visual assay test that would allow us to tell you, oh yeah, this chemical is a potential promoter of breast cancer. What's more is we showed that if we use the estrogen blocker tamoxifen, we could block estrogen's ability to induce color change in these animals. So we could not only screen potential breast cancer promoters, but we could screen potential estrogen blockers that can be used potentially by a pharmaceutical company in the treatment. You know, and of course, you do the human cell screening, but this, again, we could do by the tens of thousands. The other thing we proposed is, because people were just now starting to talk about endocrine disruptors and contaminants in the water that might act like hormones, that you could send me a sample of water and I could put some tadpoles in it and go, oop, they changed color, I'd be concerned about your water supply. That was the idea. The idea was a little mom and pop shop on the side. <laughs> my wife with the MBA, my brother-in-law with a law degree, me running the science, and, and boy, things sure took a turn from there. We haven't gone back to solve the basic problems with hyperolease yet because we actually filed a patent and we actually, we actually had a customer. So Novartis, they were Novartis at the time, came along and said, well, we'd like for you to use frogs to test atrazine. And, and this is literally, I'm literally just telling you the story almost in exact chronological order. I had never heard of atrazine, here it is now, in case you're chemically inclined. We're sort of joined at the carbon bond now, so to speak. Because if you Google Tyrone, atrazine comes up. You Google atrazine, Tyrone comes up. For <laughs> Wikipedia links us everything, atrazine and Tyrone. Anyway, it's an herbicide or a weed killer. When I say pesticide, if I do, I'll mean anything that kills a pest. I know some people in, equate insecticide and pesticide, but to me, anything that kills a pest is a pesticide. So an herbicide is a pesticide, in this case, a weed killer, of course. And it's mostly used on corn in this country. It's been used since 1958, so it's, we have a long legacy here. And we use 80 million pounds annually in the United States. And I say it that way because I can't fathom 80 million new pounds of atrazine every year being put in the environment here. It's the second biggest selling pesticide in the world. It's used in more than 80 countries, so we're talking about a global issue, the things that I'm going to talk to you about. But it's now outlawed in Europe, or as the lawyers like for me to say, it has been denied regulatory approval. <laughs> the point being that the home of Novartis, now Syngenta, is in Europe. So we're using 80 million pounds of a chemical that's been outlawed on home turf, no pun intended. So let me now, secondly, in case you haven't met him yet, introduce you to the African claw frog Xenopus face to face. And I introduce this frog this way for a couple reasons. I believe in whole animals. So before we break it apart and look at cells and how, I want to introduce you to the main character. The other reason I love to introduce this frog is it is the lab rat of the amphibian world. I never thought I'd be working on such a non-frog. It can't jump, it has no tongue, it's completely aquatic, it has a lateral line system, it's a weird frog. But the reason everybody works on, and the reason that people sequenced actually a, a related uh, species, is because everybody in the world knows Xenopus. And who, who knows the reason why? It's, I know you know. It's an interesting story. This was the very first pregnancy test. Developed in 1920, it turns out that the human pregnancy hormone HCG is so similar to what's called the luteinizing hormone in this frog that it'll make this frog lay eggs. So in 1940 or so, if you thought you were pregnant, you'd go to the doctor and they would inject your pee into the frog and if it laid eggs, they'd say, okay, fix up the you know, baby room. Now, I love this story because we were just talking about NSF. What I don't know is who's the first guy who went, hmm. <laughs> I wonder what will happen if I inject pee into a frog. And, I mean, how, do you, how do you write to NSF or something like that? that it must have been different rules back then. But the other reason I pointed out, and I know I probably don't have to do it for this audience, is that in the same way that testosterone and estrogen that worked in Hyperolius argus are exactly the same hormones in humans, synthesized the same way, functioning the same way, Here's another example of where the hormone of pregnancy is so similar to the hormone regulating reproduction in this frog that they cross-react. The idea being that as I talk to you now about endocrine disrupting compounds in frogs, keep in mind that we're probably not just talking about frogs. And when we get to the end of the talk, a tale of toads and men, I'll show you direct evidence that, that that's the case. So to make a long story short, we showed some effects. Novartis didn't like it. I said, I'm leaving. They said goodbye. And then we published a paper after we repeated the work, which technically belonged to them at the time. 
That paper was published in, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Hermaphroditic demasculinized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. You can see now why they didn't like me. I didn't pull any words back. Here's what we found, just briefly, because this is the old stuff. So this is back in 2002. We found that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box or the larynx in males, which was of concern to the manufacturer because the male larynx or voice box is testosterone dependent. The same reason that the men in this room have deeper voices in general than the women because we had got more testosterone at puberty, same thing's regulating these frogs. Suggesting that they're chemically castrated, word I like to use, they like for me to say demasculinized, but I like chemically castrated better. And here's why. If you look at the gonads of these animals, a proportion, depending on the dose, look like this. So here's the kidneys. These are the gonads, and this is from our original PNAS paper. There's testes, then it has two ovaries, then it has a large testes, then it has more ovaries. We published another paper in Environmental Health Perspectives that showed that there are a number of gonadal abnormalities that are defined by atrazine exposure or to other hormones. One is we call single-sex polygonadism. That's just a fancy way of saying many testes, which, which I love this story because this one actually made it on Jay Leno. He made some comment about what guy wouldn't want a few extra. <laughs> My comment, of course, is two will get you in enough trouble. <laughs> in either case, as you'll see, no matter how much they have, they don't work. We had lateral hermaphrodites, testes on one side, ovary on the other, testes in the front, ovaries in the back, and then these mixed ones, which regardless of how you look at it, none of this <laughs> is normal. And I point that out, one, because the manufacturer likes to go around saying, oh, Hayes is making a big deal out of nothing, it's natural variation. I've looked at tens of thousands of frogs. Does not normally naturally occur. The other reason is, and I won't ask you to do it, who, well, who knows why people think frogs are hermaphrodites naturally? Somebody always knows. Somebody always has it. Anybody? Jurassic Park. For 10 years, I'd have people ask me, well, isn't that natural? Because apparently, and I didn't realize this either, apparently in Jurassic Park, it was frog DNA that made the dinosaurs change sex. And that came originally from that Graffy paper, who actually, or somebody we were talking about, who misidentified male and female Viridiflavus, or Hyperoleus, the earlier species we were talking about. But anyway, this is not normal. That's the point. We propose that here's what happens. So if you imagine that this is your, that this is your testicle, <laughs> you should make testosterone. And I always point out to people, this literally means testicular hormone. It's the male hormone that controls most masculine features, if you will. What we propose, because there was evidence for this at the time, is that atrazine-induced aromatase, and this is the only sort of technical term I want you to, to remember. It's going to come up over and over again. Aromatase is the enzyme or a machinery that converts testosterone into estrogen, the generator of estrus, is where that word comes from. And so when these animals were exposed, they were demasculinized, and I'm showing you the simple version, I'll show you a longer version later. They were demasculinized because they were using up their testosterone, so to speak, and subsequently feminized because now they're making the female hormone, which is fine if you're a female, but a little complicated if you're a male. We showed in that same paper, the PNAS paper again, that here are control levels of testosterone measured at night. Here's atrazine-treated males. Atrazine-treated males. <laughs> and, and here's control females. So we had good evidence that they were chemically castrated and feminized. Low testosterone, small larynx, and they're growing ovaries in their testis. And so that was the first paper. Then, and I thought we were done, but then I sort of realized there were, there were some unanswered questions. One, we didn't know if the hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes. At the time, even though frogs have genetic sex determination, the chromosomes are identical, and there were no sex-specific markers. So we couldn't genotype them. We had a good idea, because if we had 20% hermaphrodites in the population, we would usually have like 30% males and 50% females. So we were missing males for every hermaphrodite that we counted. So we had some idea. And there are other reasons that I won't go into here. But we also didn't know what happened when they became adults, because we only looked at the metamorphs exposed as larvae. So would these hermaphrodites remain hermaphrodites for life? Would they shift over and become males? Would they shift over and become females? A couple unanswered questions. And we didn't know how to answer them other than to grow some frogs up for three years. But that's a hard thing to do, because that means you have to go to a student and say, hey, I have a project for you. And uh, maybe in three years, you might have some data it's a hard thing to get people to commit to. But we did it. We exposed these animals. We raised them up for three years. And, and here's what we got. See, see these two guys? 
I, I showed you, we should have put some ratings on the talk. He didn't know it was going to be X-rated. That guy looks like, if you use your imagination, he looks like he's kind of smiling. <laughs> That's his brother. And we know that now because one, we had an all-male population. We only looked at males. There's now a genetic marker called DMW that females have that males don't. So there's a unique chromosome with this marker on it. And when we genotype that guy, he's a male, and he's a male, genetically. He not only performs like a female, though, he lays viable eggs. We have three generations now in this population that hasn't had a genetic female in it. For three generations, we can expose these males to atrazine, a proportion of them turn into females, and, and we can maintain the population that way. So the other thing that we looked at, and that's actually another former student was involved in this part of the project, is we, again, can identify true genetic females, for example, in our controls, and we can show that in their gonads, they're expressing aromatase, which is the enzyme that makes estrogen, which is makes, what makes them function as females. At the same time, in our atrazine-treated animals, again, we know that our females are really males, genetically, but they express aromatase and make estrogen as if they're females. That's what turns them into females, and that's what keeps them producing eggs. That's what keeps them reproductive. So we have a connection now between this molecular event, atrazine turning on aromatase, a biochemical event, testosterone being turned into estrogen, a developmental morphological and reproductive behavior event, which was, which was pretty interesting. So we sort of have this spectrum of where we have genetic males, and 10%, as I just told you in this experiment, turn into females that make estrogen, have essentially an ovipositor, what I call cloacal labia, an absence of male breeding glands, a female-type larynx, full of eggs, and they can reproduce fully functional as a female and lay viable eggs. But I thought, okay, so now I didn't know what to do because now this is only 10% of our animals. 90% of them look like males. And so the question was, so we were getting ready to write this up. In fact, I think we may have even submitted just this part and it didn't make it. So I said, gee, what are we going to do with these other males? It seemed hard to believe that 10% of the animals were completely vulnerable and that the other 90% were normal functioning males. But I'm not a behavioral biologist. I didn't know what to look at. But I came up with some ideas. I call this the pool party experiment. The idea is you put four control real females, four genetic females in a pool at 6 p.m. You put in four control males, and you put in four atrazine-treated males, and then you ask, can these guys compete with these guys for a limited number of females? So, and I'm not a behavioral biologist, I'm just sort of making this up. Or I guess pool party, the other analogy might be the nightclub, right? So you, you, you start off in the club, the lights go out, the next morning the lights come on, and then you just see who made the hookup. And so here's how we do that, here's what that looks like. See, there's a guy, and we put stitches on him so you can see who's who. So see, there's a black stitch, black stitch, there's a guy who lost out, there's a guy who won, there's a guy who lost out. There are eggs on the bottom, so it's been a full party. And when you look at that, the pool party data, you find that the controls are pretty good. So we did this four different times. Everybody was a virgin, so no male was tested twice, no female was tested twice. This was the first time they'd ever seen the opposite sex. Experience wasn't an issue. Only two atrazine treated males ever were successful. Got the hookup, as my students say. <laughs> now imagine you're at the club, and what's that old line from Prince? Ugly lights, everybody's inspected. The lights come on. Now imagine some guy comes up, sticks a needle in your heart, and takes a blood sample. It's not, not something you want to sign up for necessarily. And so that's what we did. So we measured the blood in every one of the control males, whether or not they won or lost. Here's their average testosterone level. Then we measured every atrazine-treated male over these four experiments, so there's 16 animals being measured. There's their average. Then, if you look at the individual data, here's everybody who made the love connection. Here's the atrazine-treated animals. Here's the two that made it. And PNAS argued with me, but I said, this is the cutoff. I said, if you can't get your testosterone above five nanograms per mil, you don't cut it. Because that's the way it looks to me. Only two animals were ever able to do it, and they're above that cutoff. So the problem is, these males, whether or not they're interested or not, we don't know, but they don't get a testosterone surge when they're females around. Either they're getting beat up by the controls, or the females don't like them for whatever reason, they don't have enough testosterone to attract and successfully mate with a female. So then, I still didn't know what to do, then we did what I call the Motel 6 experiment. <laughs> the idea here is, again, virgins, they've never seen females before. Instead of making them compete at the club, we just got them a room right away. 
So you have a male and a female in here, an atrazine treated male and female. There's styrofoam in between, so they can't peep and see what the other ones are doing. And the idea here was to ask, even if you don't have to compete, can you be a successful male? Motel 6. And here's the answer. The way we answer that question is, we put them in those tanks, the next morning we collected the eggs, we let the eggs develop for three days, and some undergraduate counted thousands and thousands of eggs and figured out how many hatched and how many didn't, how many turned into tadpoles. About 80% of the controls, 80% of the eggs in a control tank are fertilized, whereas we're down to about 15% in atrazine-treated males. So even if they get a female with no competition, they're incapable of successfully fertilizing most of the eggs. And here's the reason why. So now, now that they've done all the behavioral stuff, you know, we can sacrifice them and look at what's going on. And, and it's lucky we did that in, direction, in that order, because it's kind of hard to get dead animals to reproduce. Anyway, so here's what the testis looks like in cross-section. You can probably guess which one is which. <coughs> I won't make you vote. And here's why these guys, these guys can't fertilize eggs. If I blow up a section, See, that's a testicular tubule. These are all premature sperm developing. All the dark stuff in the middle, those are all the millions of sperm heads all lined up in that tubule, ready to go throughout this testis. This testicular tubule, there's the outline of it, just has a bunch of like sort of debris and junk in it. And most of the tubules are like that. There's a few with sperm, but that's it. These guys don't have enough testosterone to attract and successfully mate with a female. Even if they're given the opportunity to mate with a female, and even if they show the behavior, which we don't know that they do, they don't make enough sperm because they don't have enough testosterone to support sperm production. So they are truly chemically castrated. This is just other stuff straight out of the paper. By the way, the, the paper just came out a month ago in PNAS. This is stuff straight out of the paper. Here's the breeding glands, which are testosterone dependent. They're large in controls, faint and small in atrazine-treated animals. Statistically significant. Further indication of a lack of testosterone. Here's the larynx or the voice box. The muscle goes all the way around the thyrohyral in a control. Um, in an atrazine-treated animal, it stops at the thyrohyral just like it does in a female. So there's not a size difference, but the arrangement of the muscle is much more feminine-like in atrazine-treated animals. So they have low testosterone. They don't show reproductive behavior in that they can't compete with control males. Even when they do, they don't have enough sperm to fertilize eggs. They're missing their androgen-dependent breeding glands. Their larynxes, or voice boxes, feminized. They're truly chemically castrated. And another paper that I'm working on with former uh, uh, graduate student Dan Buchholz, we're looking at the mechanism more thoroughly. It turns out that in frogs, GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone, controls luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone from the pituitary, just like it does in humans. The LH stimulates testosterone from the testis, but in the presence of atrazine, testosterone is converted into estrogen. In 10% of the animals, this estrogen makes them completely females. In the other 80%, the demasculinized ones that I just told you about, enough estrogen feeds back and shuts off the reproductive axis. This is exactly how birth control pill works. You make enough estrogen, and guys, if we took birth control pill, same thing would happen. We'd grow breasts, and then we would lose our fertility. So these animals, it's like they're on a little bit of estrogen on a birth control pill that's shutting down their fertility because these hormones are required for testosterone and sperm production. And that's what's happening in these animals. And we're putting this together in a, in a separate paper now. So again, all this stuff just came out. Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in male African clawed frogs. Just came out a month ago, again in PNAS. Now what have I gotten myself into? I thought I was done. I said, okay, my curiosity is now, I'm settled. But about three years ago, or two years ago, when we first started putting together the, the most recent PNAS paper, we also did a series of replicates, other families or lineages, to ask how repeatable this finding was, and if there was variation in the susceptibility. And, and I can tell you it's not. Some families, 45% turn into females. But at any rate, so we had these tanks. They were all males. They were all brothers. And my student, uh, name is Knock My Win, came up. She would come up every day and she'd say, you know, I was cleaning the tanks and there are a couple of tanks I have to pull these guys apart all the time. I said, what are you talking about? They're all male. She goes, oh no, I have to pull them apart every morning. And, and so I went down and then we saw this. There's two guys, two brothers actually. And, and then sometimes you see this, look at that, it's just a free-for-all. There's three, there's another pair coming up. That, so I thought, wow, I, in, in, in 20 years in working with Xenopus, in, in 
I'm not going to exaggerate, hundreds of thousands of frogs. I've never seen this before. But I didn't know what to do about it. I'm not a behavior biologist. So I said, well, OK, we need some data then. We need more than photographs. We need some data. So I said, go down each day and just count the number of same-sex pairs. So there are no females. We've removed all the females from those tanks. It's all males. First day, she comes back and she counts. And these are brothers, by the way. This is 40 brothers in a tub. This is 40 brothers. Count them again. Third day, she counts. Sometimes it happens in controls. There's a background level. So there's a background level in controls, but it's highly inducible or enhanced by atrazine exposure. So then I didn't know what to do. I said, OK. So I'm, I'm thinking now. It sounds like a nature paper. <laughs> you got a plan. So I'm thinking, well, now what do we do? So I said, well, and I apologize, just like I did last night. I don't know if I'm being politically correct or not. So I apologize if I use some wrong language or say something wrong. But I said, now, I said, now my, we got to figure out who's gay, the guy on the top or the guy on the bottom, right? And so it turns out, if you look at the number of pairs, same set of tanks, here's how we did that. On day one, she goes down and she counts. So again, there's a background level, but you can see it's enhanced more than threefold in the atrazine tank, side by side. Then what we did is we took the guy off the bottom, the guy's off the bottom, and we put him in the control tank. And then you double the number of same-sex pairs in the control tank, and now there's only one pair in the atrazine. Then on the next day, we took the guy off the bottom out of controls, we put it back in the atrazine-treated tank, and then look what happens. Then we take the ones off the bottom out, and they're marked, we know which ones are which. We put them in the control tank, and, and now there's no, more, there's no more party in the atrazine tank. Then we put them back in the atrazine tank, and now there's a party again. Then we take them out, and now the party goes away again, and, and, and so on. So the ones on the bottom are determining the number of same-sex pairs. And, and here, I think I've been summarized here. With the receptive males, or the ones on the bottom in the tank, you have much higher same-sex pairs than in controls. And when you put the receptive ones in the control tank, again, it doesn't go as high as the, at the, the atrazine-treated ones, but you do get an increase. And you get an absence with the exception of this one pair. Not only do the ones on the bottom control the number of pairs, so either they're soliciting or just not resisting, but they're fixed. And by fixed, I mean if you look at these pairs, the ones on the top, it's kind of different ones every time. The ones on the bottom, it's the same 12 males every time. They're fixed in that behavior. And in the controls, this is just sort of random. There's different ones on the bottom and top all the time. These guys are increasing the number of pairs because they're fixed in this female type behavior. Their gender identity. They think, as I'll show you, they think that they're females. So here's what we did. Again, I'm not a behavior biologist. I'm just trying to figure out what we do. So here's the next thing we did. We looked at the number of pairs in 12 observations in the different SIB groups. So here's one. That's the one I've been showing you. Here's another one. And they're actually cousins. And here's another one. And here's another one. So now you see the trouble I'm getting into. Same-sex behavior, homosexuality, whatever you want to call it. There's a genetic component. Some families have zero background. Some have some background. There's an environmental factor. It's inducible by atrazine, which as I'll show you causes a hormone imbalance. And it's context dependent. If you take the ones from the top and put them in a pool party, they will choose females over these receptive males. Now what you might be asking yourself, is, is it just that you have some big males that are overpowering little males? Right? And the answer is no. Here's the body weight for the ones on the top. Here's the ones on the bottom. The ones on the bottom are always bigger, which is interesting because normally the females are bigger than the males. If you look at testosterone levels, however, the ones on the top, with one exception, have higher testosterone levels than the ones on the bottom. If you look at estrogen, the ones on the top are zero. The ones on the bottom have estrogen levels as if they're females. And even if you inject these guys with GnRH, their testosterone levels go up, but so do their estrogen levels. They behave like females. They're always on the bottom. And their hormone profile is like a female. So we propose then that here's what we have. We have this spectrum of males that don't respond to atrazine. They have high testosterone, breeding glands, a male-type larynx, testis full of sperm, and they're always on top. We have males that are demasculinized, that have a male-type cloaca, no breeding glands, female-typical larynx, no sperm, and they're uninvolved. They're asexual, sort of. Then you have these animals that are not only demasculinized, they're slightly feminized, where they have a slightly feminine cloaca, no breeding glands, and even though they're still males, as I'll show you in a minute, 
They're always on the bottom as if they're a female. And then you have these completely feminized animals that I just told you about. So now that we've done all the behavioral stuff, we can start to dissect out some of these receptive males, and we find stuff like this. Here's kidneys. Those are nice looking testis, actually. This is all oviduct. So they're still male, but this is the equivalent of a man with a uterus. They're still male, they still have male gonads, but they have some female parts, and they behave as if they're females. They think that they're females. Their gender identity is female. Now, this shouldn't be surprising. I could show you kind of the same thing with estrogen, but the analogy I often use is, it's like smoking. If everybody in this room smokes cigars, some of us would get lung cancer, some of us would get asthma, some of us would beat George Burns and never show any effect at all. So there's a range of effects, even within a tub when you're exposed to something like atrazine. We should probably expect it and, and not be surprised. So, real briefly, we've shown, this is a paper we published in Nature, that similar effects occur in other species. These are leopard frogs, or this is a leopard frog. Uh, this, which I usually call the junk in the trunk, are eggs that have yoked up into this male's testis and are bursting through this male's testis. So it's not a hermaphrodite, it is a male, but it's growing eggs instead of sperm. We've shown that the doses that we're using are ecologically relevant. In other words, this isn't some wild, crazy dose that nobody would ever see. The package of atrazine recommends application at levels that are up to 290 million times our effective dose, which is 0.1 parts per billion, okay? which is 1 1,000th 1, of a grain of salt in two liters, as I always to give you a visual. These are minimum and maximum levels of agriculture runoff, temporary pools, permanent water, and precipitation. Again, here's what it takes to make hermaphrodites, and here are the habitats at risk. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. A half million pounds of atrazine go up on dust and come down in rainfall in the US every year, and they can travel over 600 miles. They can measure it in the rainwater in Minnesota from when it's applied in Kansas. Same thing in Europe. That's why it was banned instead of country by country by the whole European Union. Here's the level allowed in our drinking water, three parts per billion, which is 30 times what it takes to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frog. So do effects occur in the wild? Again, we published a paper in Nature. Uh, here's an animal. I'm going to show you a cross section through its testis. Blow it up. Blow it up. Testicular tubules that are missing sperm but include eggs throughout. In that particular study, we showed the areas of highest atrazine use are in red. This is the range historically of leopard frogs. And everywhere in red now are the areas where we found hermaphrodites and 100% of the time, atrazine contamination. I used to tell people we were controlling for latitude in this study, but this is I-80 and we were driving to a hurt meeting in Indiana and, and we collected along the way and, and got a nature paper out of it. <laughs> so, now what we're doing is that we're finishing up the summer, we finish up all the analysis, is instead of following the roads, we follow the North Platte and the Missouri and the Mississippi River. And we have a sample size that's like 500,000 over 10 years. And the idea is to not just look for a correlation between atrazine and, and hermaphrodites, but also to determine if their gradients, where these rivers start off relatively clean, all three, and ask if their gradients of increasing frequency or severity of hermaphrodites with the increase in atrazine. The other thing we're looking at is whether or not they're temporal gradients as well as spatial. Because because we did this over, because, 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 because we did this over 10 years, in some places like the North Platte where there was atrazine contamination and 92% hermaphrodites, years later, there's no atrazine and no hermaphrodites. Which doesn't mean that these guys got well, and it doesn't mean that the atrazine degraded, it just washed on down to the Gulf of Mexico but we're looking at the young of the year. So what it means is, once the atrazine is gone, the new animals aren't affected. An important finding because it says that this is not normal. Because if it were, there'd be hermaphrodites every year, not just in years when there was atrazine. So not only are there only hermaphrodites where there's atrazine, there are only hermaphrodites in our studies when there's atrazine. All I'm showing here is I'm one of the few academics who brags about what I haven't done. A number of papers since ours have come out supporting atrazine effects on gonads and amphibians. So we're, unlike the industry might tell you, they'll tell you a few things, this being one of them, unlike the industry might tell you, we're not the only ones who are finding these types of effects. <laughs> so words from our former sponsor.
They speak for themselves. <laughs> so the reason I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night is that I think in much the same way that Rachel Carson talked about the death of birds and the role of pesticides as telling us something in our pending Silent Spring, was telling us something about human health, I think in the same way over 70% of all amphibians are in decline to some extent. Atrazine is but one pesticide, and pesticides are but one cause of that decline, but I think that atrazine and pesticides are a significant one. And in much the same way that our silent spring should have been telling us something, I think our silent night should be telling us something. And you can probably see where I'm going with it in A Tale of Toads and Men, because the hormones we're talking about are synthesized and function exactly the same. A colleague of mine wrote in Echo Epidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. I've shown you evidence from more than one species of amphibian, more than one genera, more than one family even. There's also evidence in fish that I'll tell you a little bit about, not from my lab. There's evidence in reptiles and birds that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about of toads and men, the evidence in mammals, including humans, via the same types of mechanisms. So does testosterone decrease in the presence of atrazine, leading to a decrease in sperm production in other vertebrate classes? The first example is in fish, where normally salmon, when exposed to females' urine, testosterone levels go up. In the presence of atrazine, testosterone levels decline and don't go up. Seems like a story you've heard before. If you look at milt or sperm production in the same fish, it goes down as well. Very similar to what we've shown in our frogs. This is work that was done in England on salmon. So we see a decline in testosterone in fish, a decline in testosterone in frogs. This is our work. And there's studies in rats that I'll show you in more detail that show a decline in testosterone. Again, you have to be convinced that across vertebrate classes that this was just a coincidence rather than a cause-effect relationship. In humans, Shauna Swan showed the following. If you look at controlled men in Columbia, Missouri, compared to men, subfertile men, she called them, who had low sperm count and couldn't get their wives pregnant, there's significantly more atrazine in their urine. And I don't want to overstate her data, but if you look at this, there's enough atrazine in the urine to chemically castrate and produce the effects that we've produced in frogs, about 0.1 parts per billion. If you look at, and I'm going to change the axis now, if you look at levels from a study in California in 1993, here are the levels in field workers, and now I'll alter the axis again, because here are the levels in men who apply atrazine. Men who apply atrazine have up to 2,400 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. That's 24,000 times what's associated with low fertility in men in Columbia, Missouri. That's 24,000 times what we use in the laboratory to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. Or as I tell my so-called public audiences, one of these guys could pee in a bucket. I could dilute it 24,000 times and use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and make hermaphrodites out of 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Now, one issue I've become involved in is the environmental justice issue, because we know nothing about the health of these men, because they're primarily Mexican, Mexican-American workers with life expectancies of 50 that, in addition to atrazine, are exposed to chemicals like chlorpicrin, which was originally developed as a nerve gas in California. And as I said, the vast majority are Mexican, Mexican-American workers with little access to health care. What's more is, in terms of environmental justice issue, if you look at California, as you may know, California, at least until recently, was the fifth largest economy in the world. That economy was based on agriculture. One in 10 jobs are in agriculture. 30% of the land is in agriculture. We produce 350 agricultural products. 50% of the US is food. 50% of the United States is food comes from California. We use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic. If we now plot onto here the top 10 counties for agriculture, the top 10 pesticide users <coughs> using counties, and now plot the 30 poorest towns in California, look at the overlap. So the poorest people living in the most contaminated areas, doing the jobs that expose them to the most pesticides are the ones that make us the fifth largest economy in the world or wherever, wherever we stand now. So this becomes a significant environmental justice issue because there's a targeted group that we need to worry about.
So the other side of the equation is aromatase turned on by atrazine. It won't produce egg yolk and egg yolk production in humans, but we know that aromatase and estrogen are associated with mammary tumors and prostate cancer. So is there evidence that we should be concerned about? For prostate cancer, I'm going to read to you from a paper published in the International Journal of Occupational and Environmental Health. The paper was, the study was conducted in a plant that produces atrazine in San Gabriel, Louisiana, in a community that's 80% black or African American. And I'm reading it to you because our lawyers say that I'm misrepresenting their findings. So I'm going to read to you exactly what they wrote out of their own factory. They wrote, quote, the increase in all cancers combined seen in the overall study group was concentrated in the company employee group. Sounds like a nice place to work. They wrote, quote, the increase in prostate cancer in male subjects was concentrated in company employees. They wrote, quote, the prostate cancer increase was further concentrated in actively working company employees. So if you actually go to work, you're more likely to get prostate cancer. They wrote, quote, all but one of these cases occurred in men with 10 or more years since hire. So the more loyal you are to the company, the more likely you are to get prostate cancer. And finally, and I think most significantly, analyses restricted to company employees also found that the prostate cancer increase was limited to men under 60 years of age. For a disease that most men get when they're over 65, every one of these men were 50 years old except one, and the increase was 8.4-fold. The reason I point out it's an African-American community, I visited Syngenta, they wouldn't let me come in, but their waste or whatever comes out of that pipe dumps right into the Mississippi, most of which looks like that. I mentioned the 80% African-American community because here are the top 13 cancers in the US. What's in red now are, of those 13, we're asking how many are African Americans more likely to get? 11 out of the 13. Is that because there's a biological difference or is that because African Americans like Latin Americans are more likely, or Latino Americans, are more likely to live and work in areas where they're exposed to pesticides and other chemicals associated with these kinds of health hazards? What's more is if you look at mortality, Relative to Caucasian Americans, African Americans are more likely to die, corrected for healthcare access, of 13 out of 13, with prostate cancer being 2.5. Just by being a black man, you're two and a half times more likely to die from prostate cancer. And the response of the industry and environmental toxicology and chemistry, the society that's tried to ban me from speaking there, was that they say that this is a defamatory remark. And their response was, we don't put our factory in places just because there are black people there. We put our factory in the places with the cheapest real estate, and that just happens to be where most black people live. They actually said that to me. So, with regards to breast cancer, as I already told you, in rats, testosterone goes down with atrazine, and there's a concomitant increase in estrogen. Just like we've shown in frogs, just like they've shown in fish, just like they've shown in turtles, just like they've shown in alligators, quails, chickens, now rats. This is a study done by the EPA. In those same rats, there's an increase in the incidence of mammary tumors that are estrogen dependent. In humans, if you take a normal human adrenal cell, it doesn't express aromatase or make estrogen, but you expose it to atrazine and it does. There's now not only this lab, but my lab and several others have repeated this effect. So we're showing aromatase induction, just by coincidence, in fish, frogs, alligators, turtles, chickens, quails, rats, now human cell lines, just by coincidence. At least one study showed with a p-value of 0 0.0001 that women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine are more likely to develop breast cancer relative to women who live in the same community, studied out in Kentucky, but don't use their well water. So that alone wouldn't tell us but when we have experimental evidence showing what atrazine can do in this aquatic organism, it sort of backs up what atrazine can do in this aquatic organism. At the same time, the human cell line studies are helping us understand on the molecular level how atrazine regulates aromatase. We think we pretty much have that figured out. And what's significant is, and what they're most concerned about is, this is from one of my graduate students who's now showing an induction of aromatase in human breast cancer cells. This is significant because of the following. Cancer happens when a cell goes bad. See, it's red, that means bad. The estrogen receptor is important in breast cancer because breast tissue is estrogen dependent. Now, how much sense does that make? Have you ever thought about this? 
When do most women get breast cancer? After menopause. You're getting an estrogen-dependent cancer at a time when your estrogen levels are the lowest they've ever been in your life. The reason is because, one, breast cancer is dependent on lifetime exposure to estrogen or estrogen-like compounds. But also, when you develop the breast cancer, it turns out that breast cancers, the fibroblasts, express aromatase locally. So even though your blood levels are low, you make estrogen locally, which stimulate those damaged cells to turn into tumors. This local expression is so important that the top treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole, which knocks out aromatase. How much sense does that make when knocking out aromatase and estrogen to treat breast cancer, when we're using 80 million pounds of a chemical that's the most common contaminant of drinking water that does exactly the opposite? What's more is Novartis Oncology offers treatment for cancers that range from breast cancer. The same company that gave us 80 million pounds of atrazine and aromatase inducer associated with breast cancer now gives us letrozole, which blocks aromatase to treat breast cancer. So that if you're living in a community and taking letrozole to treat your breast cancer, how is that impacted by the atrazine in your drinking water? Now, I get into a little bit of trouble. The lawyers wrote to my dean, because I wrote a paper called The One-Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures for Cancer, that went to Obama's, <laughs> straight to Obama's office. And in fact, there's a press release coming out this week. They wrote to my dean, they said, while Syngenta does share some corporate history with Novartis and AstraZeneca, it has been completely independent of both since November 2000. Syngenta simply does not manufacture cell pharmaceutical products. November 2000. Well, it turns out in January 2000, they published a paper, not me, where they wrote, the observed induction of aromatase, the rate-limiting enzyme, and the conversion of androgens to estrogens may be an underlying explanation for some of the reported hormonal disrupting and tumor-promoting properties of these herbicides in vivo in January 2000. And just by coincidence, in July 2000, a marketing application for first-line letrozole treatment of postmenopausal women was applied for by the FDA. So I'm not saying there's any kind of conspiracy going on. I'm just saying there's an interesting set of chronological coincidences where in January 2000, they discovered that atrazine induces aromatase and promotes breast cancer. By July of 2000, they start selling aromatase blocker to treat breast cancer. And by November 2000, they stopped selling atrazine and spin off Syngenta. That's just a interesting set of coincidences. <laughs> so I've talked to you about prostate and mammary cancer. Atrazine also causes immune failure in rats, neuro damage in rats that are exposed in utero. An EPA laboratory showed that atrazine, because of the hormone imbalances it creates, causes abortion in four strains of rats. Of those that don't abort, their sons are born with prostate disease when their mother's exposed to atrazine. The daughters are born with impaired mammary development, which looks like that. These are three different EPA laboratories. And when those rats grow up, their offspring show retarded growth and development, such that this rat suffers from effects of atrazine that his grandmother was exposed to. So when I look at, I like to read this one out loud, Syngenta assumes no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. <laughs> That's a word from our sponsor, folks. When I think about the fact that atrazine, even after use in France, is still in the environment after 20 years. When I think about that issue and the impact on public health, I'm moved to become, you heard, politically active because this, is not, this issue is not about us. We've been exposed. Our children and our grandchildren will be exposed. And if we take these rat studies to tell us anything about us, which is that's why we do them in the first place, right? Our grandchildren's grandchildren will be potentially affected by atrazine and other chemicals that we're putting into the environment today. When I think about that, and I think about statements like this from the old EPA, I have faith in the new one, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. It raises me to a whole new level of awareness and sense of responsibility. I have a website that I don't maintain as well as I could. But from there, you can, if you're inclined, there's a button you push called Act Now, and you can write directly to Congress you can write directly to Syngenta. You can write directly to the EPA with your concerns, if you are moved to be concerned. Keith Ellison has just written a bill in US Congress. I worked with him when he was in Minnesota. To ban atrazine, you can write directly to Keith that He dropped a bill on Earth Day. And in support of this, after reading the data, the, the, the papers yourself, if you like. Uh, if you're on Facebook, a group of college students that I spoke to started a page, Global Citizens Against Atrazine. 
And from there, there's a petition on the breast cancer site that is looking for 20,000 signatures. They have about 10. If you care more about frogs, there's another petition. None of these are run by me. Save the frogs. They're looking for 100,000 signatures. I think they're at about 5,000 right now. And obviously, folks, as I close up today, I've, I, I, they, I was told I have to do it. I've crossed the line. <laughs> in part, in part, because a woman once told me in Minnesota, she said, Dr. Hayes, that was a great talk, but it was half a talk. She said, you told us what the problem was. You didn't tell us what to do about it. And now I'm telling you there are things that, that we can do about it. Some disagree, including my advisor, who I love and admire and respect. But if the other side's putting information out there, I think we have an obligation to become politically active. And in fact, another great orator and person that I respect said just the opposite of the following. He said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And I've taken that as my responsibility as well. So thank you for your time. Questions or comments? Yes. You showed a map in the U.S. with atrazine levels, and California was low. Why is that? Upset? California is low because we grow food. If you live in the Midwest, you grow corn, soy, corn, soy, and actually now mostly corn, 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 corn. So you're using a lot of atrazine. That's all 90% of their crops. I'm making that number up, but it's a big number. California, we have 350 agricultural products, and atrazine is only used on corn. The biggest use of atrazine, actually, and it's not low. It's, it's still significant. The biggest use is actually in forestry in California because they use it after they cut the logs so that weeds don't grow back for replanting, not actually on corn. So even those, those uh, colors you saw, you notice that they don't match over with the agricultural counties I drew in. They're matching over with the, the lumber. Same thing as you go up through Oregon and Washington. There's a lot of use on um, trees, tree farms. So you've got to give us some good news. Is there a reversibility in that? I mean, if, you're, if you eliminate the atrazine from the system, either as a juvenile or as an adult, do you see any of these things? Excellent question. It's what in endocrinology we call organizational versus activational effect. If you're exposed developmentally, no. Darnell, who we call him, will be a female for the rest of his life. If we remove the atrazine and estrogen levels go down, he doesn't produce eggs as much, but he's still a female. If you're exposed as an adult to atrazine, and I believe we published this, or either that or it's coming out in the next one. If you're an adult, your testosterone levels go down, but if you remove the atrazine, presumably you turn to normal, as far as we can tell. But if your brain is fixed on that gender identity, or if you completely turn into a female, that's a permanent effect. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about some of these ethical issues with, with migrant workers being uh, typically young males. I don't know. No, and, and again, that's, that's all correlative work. And, and we talked about this yesterday with the undergraduates. That's difficult data to get because you're talking about a population, especially in Arizona, right, who's not really interested in, in, in going in and complaining about things and trusting officials and all that kind of stuff. So those would be really difficult data to get with the human participation and, and you know, kinds of you know, things that you would need to get the, uh, the information. Yes? Um, going back to the thoughts, um, does acting do anything with the female thoughts? Uh, that's a hard question to answer because, to be honest, we don't look at females anymore. And the reason is that females already have so much estrogen that a little boost in estrogen that they're getting from atrazine probably doesn't have an impact on their physiology, at least that we can measure. So for example, it's easy to measure the sperm reduction, but a female lays 2,000 plus eggs. And to find an effect, we just haven't seen one. So it may in female frogs, but not that we've ever detected. And to be honest, we aren't even really looking anymore because we've never found anything. So the answer is not that we've seen. Doesn't mean no, though. And, and estrogen in general, estrogen is much worse for a male. Estrogen eventually will kill a male. If you expose a male to estrogen for more than a month, I think what happens is their liver gets completely taken over from making vitiligenin, egg yolk, and then they eventually end up with some kind of weird kidney damage, vacuolated kidneys that causes an osmoregulatory problem and they fill it with water and die. Females have a better way of, I guess, regulating and metabolizing the estrogen. And that's interesting because the reacts come in good and, and, that, and, that's what, and that, I think, has to do with, one, in a female frog, there's more consistent estrogen levels, whereas in rats, normally estrogen cycles. And when you're exposed to atrazine, the studies have shown you get an elevated level of estrogen, which actually has detrimental effects on the, on the rats. And, and it probably is a matter of measuring the right thing. I once gave a talk called Frogs Don't Have Breasts. If they did, there probably would be an effect on frogs, but um, it was at a mammary gland conference, so I thought it was an appropriate title. Because people, 
<laughs> People look at me like, why are you giving a talk at a mammary gland? <laughs> Yes, in the back. Um, isn't it true that in large parts of the I guess, civilized world, or I'm not sure how much of the world, sperm counts in men have been declining steadily? So There's good evidence. There's good data for that. Is it correlated with the spread of atrazine, when we started using atrazine? It's, I know there are a lot of other things. That and that's what it's correlated with. There's a lot of things. Because it's correlated with the increased pesticide use and so-called endocrine disruptor use. And I don't know that any studies sorted out which chemicals, but that's been the proposal that, that that's part of the problem. And a lot of those data come out of Europe where supposedly they've been banking and measuring sperm count the same way for some phenomenal number of years. And so it's a, a really good, believable piece of data. And it's mostly, quote, in the, in the developed world, if I'm not mistaken, right. where you see that relationship, Northern Europe and, and the US. I think there's been a 50% decline. Don't quote me on that. I, I don't want to give out numbers that will prove inaccurate, but it's significant. We're still doing okay, though. It's, there's no population problem. <laughs> yeah. So, is it right that uh, actually doesn't buy or magnify the nutrients that all the exposures through water? Or yeah. Through it's highly water soluble. It's not in your corn. Um, it, your exposure is going to be through drinking water unless you are a, a well, two, two things. Somebody told me to remind. You can get it through the shower. And those occupational levels are from inhalation and skin, not from drinking water. And in Australia, they put it in swimming pools to control the algae. So little kids swim in it in Australia. So I don't want to say yes or no. My, my guess is no, but. Yeah, well, some of it is tap water, apparently. Somebody once told me Avion spelled backwards is naive. I never realized that. But then I guess you have to worry about the plastics leaching out in your bottle if you get that. Others, other, other questions or comments? Yes? Well, I have sort of a, a basic science question to get away from the applications with respect to humans. Um, a lot of the patterns that you describe are fairly typical of the naturally occurring clonal species of both fishes, and even there are even some things in birds that, that are rather similar. Um, now these things date back, in some cases, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Do you think there is some natural equivalence to atrazine that have produced these similar patterns? There, there are some estrogens, estrogenic phytoestrogens are a perfect example. And there's some that even, there's great stories of where there's even coevolution. So there's a type of clover, I think, that makes an estrogenic compound that can act like a birth control pill. And the, and the story is that the, the rodents that eat plants in bad years will switch over to eating this clover and then they get the phytoestrogens and then that decreases their reproduction and then the plant material grows back and they switch back to their normal, you know. I mean, so there's some neat stories like that. And certainly even for birth control pill, the first birth control pills that were made was by extracting similar compounds from yams. In Mexico, of course, because it wasn't allowed in the US. Um, from yams. So there are natural compounds that can act as endocrine disruptors. Um, and again, some which may even have an evolutionary story behind them. Um, and the, I mean, the other evolutionary story is that the estrogen receptor, which is required for female reproduction, was the first receptor to evolve. And, and uh, according to the phylogenies. And, and so the idea is that receptor didn't have to be so specific because there were no other hormones around, so to speak. And that that's why estrogen is so much more, we see so, much, so many more endocrine disruptors because that receptor is just not as specific. There was no selection for it to be. Until now, where I hear a story is we produce a thousand new chemicals a day. So you're bound to find some that interact. So you've obviously run into some um, detractors. <laughs> uh, That's an interesting word for it, yeah. Have you seen anything, um, politically speaking, change in the past year since the administration was I think so. I think we have a whole new EPA. One of the first things Lisa Jackson, when she took over the EPA, said was we're going to throw out the Bush stuff and bring science back into the EPA process. She opened up four new reviews for atrazine under, and again, I'm not going to take credit for it, but under the uh, um, uh, suggest or, or, or prodding of Barbara Boxer, who I had written to and people had written to from my um, website. And, and they're starting the new reviews now. And I think I can say this now, in an interesting turn, the EPA legal branch is now pursuing people who sell and use atrazine, which I'm not sure how they do that when, in fact, they okayed it for the market, but that's what's happening now. So, and I've had a little bit of involvement in that. Yes? I, what, I, what I think will happen, a couple things I want to say, and I, got, I don't know how long you guys go, but I, I got nowhere to be till 10, so I'll stay here all night. Um, 
what, what I think has happened, and what I, what I, again, I don't want to take a lot of credit for it, but I think awareness has been risen in a, on a number of different fronts. There's a class action lawsuit right now where six states are suing Syngenta to take atrazine out of the water, which would be so expensive that they wouldn't sell it anymore. The Center for Biological Diversity is suing Syngenta for atrazine contamination where there's endangered species of fish and amphibians. So there's litigation. There's a ton of publications coming out on, on humans, on birth defects, on low birth weight, more frog stuff. So they're facing publication. Um, the EPA has opened up four new reviews, so they're facing regulation. There's bills being entertained in Minnesota and, and, and in Illinois and on the, on the federal level. So what I, what, I, what I hope is that they're spending a lot of money fighting on all of these fronts. They're getting a lot of bad publicity. And what I hope that will happen is that the EPA will realize whether or not they regulate atrazine, that the main point is we want regulatory to look at these things in a different way. There are 80,000 chemicals that went on the market before there was ever an EPA in existence. There was no regulation, there was no test that had to be passed when things like DDT and atrazine and metolachlor and, and TBT and all these things went on the market. So I hope there's gonna be a major reform and a difference in how we weigh out public health and environmental health relative to how we weigh out um, economic concerns, which, which that's what this is, corn, right? Corn is money. Atrazine increases corn yield by 1.2%. That's a hundred million dollars a year. So, yes. Um, about ten years ago, there was a spate of reports uh, of amphibians in Minnesota growing supernumerary blooms and deformities. Is that the limb damage? Yes and no. So the most direct cause of the limb deformities is a trematode that burrows into the limb, which uses snails as a as a intermediate host. And the only link with atrazine is that atrazine causes a a change in the um, atrazine and nitrates, a change in the um, amount of algae that, or plant material that's available and it causes an increase in the snails, which increases the host for the trematode. It also lowers immune function in snails so that they get more infections and it lowers immune function in frogs so that they get more infections when the parasite leaves the snail and goes to the frog. So there's an indirect relationship and that, that's all published by multiple laboratories, none of them mine. So, thank Tyrone for an excellent talk. Thank you.